Welcome back to War Economy and State. This is our monthly foreign policy and international affairs podcast here at the Mises Institute. And I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor here at the Mises Institute. And joining me is my usual co-host, Zachary Yost. And I've known Zachary for a few years. He's been a frequent contributor to the Mises Wire and also was recently, that is late last year, a Marcellus Policy Fellow at the John Quincy Adams Society. And they published his white paper on Taiwan and China-Taiwan relations and uh, touching on issues of China potentially invading Taiwan. And we've touched on that a little bit in a past Radio Rothbard episode, which we'll link to in uh, whatever formats we can. Uh, but we're back to talk a little bit about Taiwan, not so much from the str- the uh, tactical side, although we'll, we'll mention that a little bit, but from the strategic side. And uh, things have actually changed a little bit. We now know a little bit more about how the rest of the world outside NATO behaves in response to foreign policy aggression from other states. Turns out it's not actually the way that NATO would hope it would go necessarily, Uh, But since Nancy Pelosi has insisted on flying over there and making a big deal out of it, and people also seem to be under the the impression that the U.S. uh, explicitly supports an independent Taiwan, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. So we'll just kind of talk a little bit about it and then just speculate about uh, what uh, what we think might happen if China were to become progressively more Uh, aggressive toward unifying Taiwan in a de facto way back into China. So just just to start us off then, Zach, uh, right, I noticed that in some of the conservative media, they were uh, basically trying to accuse Biden of, of, I guess, reversing U.S. policy and, and being okay with Taiwan being part of China. Um, that basically they they gave in, they they surrendered to China, they refused to really press the issue of Taiwanese independence, forgetting the fact that uh, U.S. policy has never been in favor of a of an independent Taiwan. Correct? Yes, since the U.S. stopped recognizing Taiwan as China. So to go way back. As many listeners probably know, the Chinese Civil War, the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek lost and retreated to the island of Taiwan. And despite, you know, only controlling Taiwan and some tiny islands off the coast of the mainland, uh, Taiwan, the Republic of China, was recognized as the government of China for decades and decades. And then in the 70s, Um, in a sort of Cold War politicking. Nixon went to China, and eventually (laughs) the end result was the U.S. recognized the People's Republic of China, the commies, Red China, as China, (laughs) and stopped recognizing the Republic of China, a.k.a. Taiwan, as the government of China. And until that point, (laughs) it's sort of hilarious in a way, uh, Taiwan had had the China seat in the UN Security Council. So this tiny island nation that supposedly, you know, governed all of China and only controlled this island (laughs) could veto at the UN and all that sort of stuff. Since that time, uh, when that happened, Congress passed the um, Taiwan Relations Act. This act did not say that the U.S. is responsible for defending Taiwan or anything like that. What it did is it basically said it's the law that the U.S. has to sell defensive weapons to Taiwan for it to defend itself. And there have been various communiques and policies and things like that. And the U.S. excuse me, has abided by its own version of the one China policy. This is different than China's version of the one China policy. That is, there's one China and the PRC is that China and Taiwan's this break off province. America's one China policy says the PRC is the government of China, but it does not say that Taiwan, it's sort of ambiguous as to whether Taiwan is part of China or not. 
And speaking of ambiguity, for decades, our explicit policy <laughs> has been that of strategic ambiguity, which is we have no official policy as to what we would do in the event Taiwan was invaded by China. We have not said, Chi uh, Taiwan, we will defend you. We've not said, China, back off, or we'll attack you if you try to attack Taiwan. Official policy is we, <laughs> we don't have an official policy, as it were. Another crucial thing to understand is what, what the status of Taiwan is. Now, de facto, Taiwan is an independent country. It has a government. For a while, it had the tallest building in the world, modern economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But aside from like some tiny islands in the Pacific and some places in South and Central America, no one recognizes Taiwan as a government or as the government of China. But everyone basically has unofficial relations with Taiwan and the Taiwanese government. Um, and many listeners might be familiar with <laughs> uh, how extensive trade is with Taiwan because they produce like a huge portion of the world's microchips. And that's been a huge issue for the past few years. And there's legislation about it in the U.S. to bring production here, all sorts of stuff like that. So Taiwan is a country that no one recognizes as a country. And Taiwan, it's quite important to note, still the, the government of Taiwan maintains that it is the legitimate government of China. Taiwan has not declared independence, meaning that it would become Taiwan, as it were. They would relinquish their claim, basically, to be the rightful government of China and they just move into the future as Taiwan. They have not done that. And it's a point of great contention within Taiwan about that. <laughs> and in fact, in polling, there's a difference. Um, lots of polling, Taiwanese people say they'd fight to defend Taiwan if it was invaded. But actually, less people say they would defend Taiwan if the invasion was a result of Taiwan declaring independence. So that's just in interesting aside. Now, when it comes to U.S. politics, uh, which is quite driven by the heart <laughs> rather than the head, uh, tons of people who pay attention to politics to some extent just love Taiwan. It's understandable why, you know, they're not the godless commie heathens. Uh, and they think, oh, we should recognize Taiwan as independent, you know, <laughs> not even thinking about whether Taiwan wants to declare independence, because <laughs> it's quite a controversial issue there. And so there's a great deal of support for Taiwan, but there's a great deal of ignorance about all the technicalities and complications of that relationship and what it would mean were the U.S. to just say, Taiwan, you're a country, that, and we recognize you. Well, I think that's one of the few times that uh, pragmatism has won out uh, in the long term in U.S. policy is this ambiguity over the issue. Um, we're refusing to say you would defend uh, Taiwan or absolutely we will not uh, join into an alliance with Taiwan. I mean, things change over time and it would just seem that the pragmatic thing to do is just leave your options open uh, without picking a fight with Beijing would seem to be the, the, uh, uh, the what makes sense. All that, that's, but as you know, Americans, they, they, they have to take this like moralistic position on everything. This is something that uh, in, in U.S.-Japan relations uh, that Ralph Rako has noted a lot, uh, and, just, and East Asia in general, especially in the 40s and 50s, was that everything had to have this moralistic tone and Anytime the U.S. fights a country, it has to have unconditional surrender. And it doesn't matter how many cities of a million people you have to burn to the ground. Uh, what's right is right. And it doesn't matter how many people you kill. Uh, that's a very American way of going about it, right? If we look at the history of diplomacy in Western Europe, especially, uh, where states recognized, well, th this is actually relevant to the Taiwan issue, right? Is that uh, just one of the weird things about the state system that came out of the 17th century is that states exist if other states say they exist. Uh, 
And so if you can just get uh, some critical mass of recognition of, of your statehood from other states within your state, you're both a de jure and a de facto state. Uh, and so Taiwan's actually in a pretty weird situation, whereas for a long time has been a de facto state. Usually after like 10 years or whatever, where you're a de facto state who does your own thing, people just start fine, whatever. The, the other regimes of the world just recognize you. Uh, but this is just that odd case where decades later, you've got a lot of regimes still say, you've got states saying, well, I don't know if that state's an actual state or not. And and just the way the state system works, that actually determines whether you're a, a real sovereign state is on the opinions of other sovereign states. And it doesn't have to be that way, but that's certainly the way it's been for 300 years or so. Yeah, and a lot of the unrecognized states, <laughs> the sort of de facto states, are not modern developed states. They're like Somaliland or... Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, or uh, the breakaway places in Georgia, or the Donbass, <laughs> People's Republics. These are not, you know, they're, they didn't have the tallest building in the world, Taipei 101, for a few years until it was surpassed. They don't have, you know, a, they're not a crucial hub in the world's manufacturing network, um, things like that. Uh, but yeah, it is a complicated situation, and uh, it would be, <laughs> there have been moves towards more normalizing relations. I can't remember if it was Lithuania or Estonia or Latvia. <laughs> One of the Baltic states has sort of upgraded their uh, sort of relationship with Taiwan, and China, of course, went nuts, uh, threatening all sorts of embargoes and everything else. But um, yeah, it's it's obviously made more complicated by China's large economic influence in the world and, and things like that. Yeah, Taiwan, probably among quasi-states, by far the, the highest standard of living, right? Because as you note, a lot of these breakaway areas, they're just, they're poor backwaters that... Um, they they don't have relation trade relations with 150 other states uh, like Taiwan does. And I'm old enough to remember the 80s when you would buy lots of toys and products and stuff where they would still say made in Taiwan. You don't see that much for consumer goods uh, like you used to. You saw a lot of made in Japan stuff, too. Now everything's made in China. Um, but yeah, I mean, that really drove home how Taiwan was its own thing. And uh, so it really is an unusual situation in terms of Taiwan's status, uh, even though it's not recognized as a sovereign state. Uh, and so it, it does really demand some level of pragmatism then if you're going to deal with it. And I think most of the world is used to that. You just see how the Russians behave, right? Well, we just we let practical realities guide us as to who we treat as as other states that are useful to us. And China's or in Russia's willing to do business with anybody. I mean, you can just look at the way that they uh, they deal with Turkey, which is part of NATO, right? They're like, well, you're part of NATO, but we're going to just try and win you over to our side as much as we can anyway. We're not going to we don't care what that says about NATO's legitimacy or whatever. And Russia doesn't go to uh, Turkey and say, well, the only way we'll deal with you is if you give up your NATO membership. I mean, they know that's not going to happen, but they know they can get what they need out of uh, Turkey anyway without making these big, grandiose demands. Uh, but the U.S. seems to love to do that. And in some ways, then, it's sort of like like China and that the U.S. is always making these big moralistic claims and demands and uh, lots of posturing to uh, um, to uh, virtue signal, essentially, to local interest groups. And that's what I think, that's what the American right seems to want right now. We, we need lots of big gestures suggesting that we hate the commies and we love in it, the idea of an independent Taiwan, even though that might actually be really bad for Taiwan, doing a bunch of, uh, I'm not sure that Pelosi's trip to Taiwan has improved Taiwan's situation as, at all. Um, although, I don't know, they don't seem to mind, but I, I guess it's just hard to predict what that could lead to then. Uh, with with the U.S. just seemingly becoming much more involved in Taiwan all of a sudden. Right. So I <laughs> I think this trip was a disaster <laughs> uh, from both Taiwan's long-term interest and the U.S.'s long-term interest. Um, 
as we discussed in the previous Radio Rothbard episode, China can't invade Taiwan right now. It doesn't have that capacity. But that does not mean Taiwan is without issues. One of the largest issues is that they're rather lackadaisical <laughs> about their defense. I mean, of all the countries in the world, Taiwan, oh, excuse me, has uh, about, <laughs> the, it, it's the most conceivable that this is a very modern state that could be invaded and conquered and completely subjugated, uh, like Poland in World War II or something, something that doesn't happen much anymore. Um, yet, last year, they spent 2.1% of their GDP on their military. As I discussed in my paper and uh, in the Radio Rothbard episode, they theoretically could field over 2 million troops if they deploy their reservists. But the quality <laughs> and morale of the reservists is definitely in question. And part of the reason for that is they openly state, uh, you know, uh, journalists interview people, and I mean, the government officials have also stated openly uh, that they expect that the U.S. with Japan will just swoop in if there's an invasion and they'll take care of everything pretty fast, and uh, that's it. <laughs> so why would you, you know, spend decades and decades, you know, having millions of people waste thousands and thousands and millions of man hours, you know, training and buying all this equipment and everything when, you know, Uncle Sam, or rather Uncle Sucker, will come in and take care of it for you. And what message does Pelosi's visit send? It tells the Taiwanese leadership, the U.S. has got our back. They're going to pick up the tab. And we can continue our lazy free riding that we've been getting away with for a long time. And I fear that the reception Pelosi has received in the U.S., or even lots of my libertarian friends and lots of conservatives like applauding Pelosi, they're like, I thought I'd never say this, but you know, well done, Pelosi, blah, 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 blah. What incentive is this going to send to all of the other politicians or would-be politicians in the U.S. Go to Taiwan. Go visit Taiwan and say, Taiwan, we stand with you. And everyone in, back home in America will cheer. And, you know, you'll get points for standing up to China. Um, so I think <laughs> that's bad for America in that we're, you know, letting these people free ride off of us. And as I discuss in my paper, <laughs> It's highly questionable if the U.S. could stop the invasion and it would undoubtedly, as things currently stand, be a disaster, huge loss of life. Um, but it's also bad for Taiwan because they're being lazy and not going to be as prepared as they should be. I, You know, somebody should produce like some sort of graph, um, a statistic, a ticker showing how many people put the uh, the Taiwanese flag like in their social media <laughs> profile now that uh, now that we of course we know that's a thing like with Ukraine and I do see Ukrainian flags flying here and there in Denver the question is though those might be actual Ukrainians so I don't I don't know I never know how like if this is just like some upper middle class white person who's virtue signaling or if it's like a genuine Ukrainian uh, but but I could see that becoming a thing, right? Suddenly the U.S., is, you get all these Americans just on fire with standing with Ukraine or standing with Taiwan all of a sudden. And that would probably not lead to uh, to more rationalism and pragmatism in American politics on this issue for sure. It would seem that if you were Taiwan, you would want to uh, embrace maybe more the Swiss model of uh, very, very active self-defense and having a top-notch military force. And we've we've discussed that in passing. I think we need to do it a little bit more in the future is just talk about uh, the, uh, the Swiss and how really for centuries the Swiss have had this reputation as just like these uh, extremely effective fighters and uh, they just horribly feared mercenaries 300 years ago, and they never really lost that reputation. 
Right, yeah. I mean, as we talked about in the last episode, Switzerland basically successfully deterred a Nazi invasion, basically because they armed the entire populace. And, you know, uh, shooting was the national pastime, et cetera, et cetera. In contrast, Taiwan has some of the strictest gun laws on the planet. And um, <laughs> it's actually a quite interesting. I've been doing some reading about the British Home Guard during World War II, which was uh, quite interesting. It, it really was one. It, so basically, it was comprised of basically all the people who were either too young to join the military, too old to join the military, or who were. Uh, worked in factories and whatnot and couldn't join the military because they were in like a necessary profession in like three months uh, after its formation was announced. And it was announced in part because <laughs> it was spontaneously happening and the British government was sort of worried of all these private militias forming to defend the country that <laughs> they couldn't control. Within three months, it, it had like 1.5 million members. Um, sort of a spun, one of the largest, if not the largest, all-volunteer force in human history. It's hard to picture that happening in Taiwan because no one takes it seriously. Uh, there was a sort of infamous uh, piece in the Wall Street Journal last uh, fall where they interviewed reservists, like people, you know, after they graduate high school, basically have to have some mandatory training. And they're like, yeah, I just moved tires around and spent all day watching American war movies and like drawing manga. And uh, so it's like, how are these people going to defend <laughs> the country, even if they're willing, which is, you know, talk is cheap. There's all these polls saying they would defend the country. But they also say at the same time, the U.S. would come and it'd be over fast anyway. So it's, uh, I have concerns about the, <laughs> the fighting spirit of Taiwan, which is necessary to resist. Well, you were uh, you mentioned a 2.1 percent of GDP being spent on defense. And for people who just what does that number mean? Right. That's that's a fairly low number for a country that's next to a very huge country um, that has a, a policy, basically, of forcibly forcing that country uh, into into it, uh, absorbing that country. Um, I, probably the highest GDP percentage I've seen is maybe Saudi Arabia, which is around 10% if memory serves. And that's just off the charts. That's way huger than most other countries. But a lot of countries, especially ones facing threats, it's pretty standard to see three, four, five percent of GDP spent. The U.S. spends three percent of its GDP on defense, which is way too much for an economy as gigantic as the U.S. The U.S. wouldn't need to spend nearly that much uh, to, maintain an effect, to maintain an effective defense force. But Taiwan doesn't have an economy the size of the U.S. So two percent is just teeny tiny. That's I think it's like 14 or 15 billion bucks. It's, right. it's not not that much. So you get these fully integrated NATO countries that are spending 2% or 1.8% even. But those are countries well ensconced within Western Europe and know that uh, that really they're the only threat they face anyway is the Russians, who are just teeny tiny compared to the Chinese anyway, and, and, teeny, and way more even teeny tiny compared to the U.S., uh, and look, and now they should probably feel all the all that much better looking at how much the Russians have struggled in Ukraine in terms of overrunning the country. I do think the Russians will peel off a significant portion of that country, but they just don't have the capability to roll into the Vov or whatever they call it now, uh, or right up to the Hungarian border or anything like that. But in terms of just dominating Taiwan, cutting off trade, right, as you've noted, like a real uh, establishing a beachhead on Taiwan, going across the 90 miles of the strait, uh, really subjugating the place military, immensely expensive, could lead to horrible, horrible things. But there's lots of other ways they can inflict damage on, on Taiwan. And that leads us then to the other question of uh, and it also doesn't mean that that internal politics in China couldn't reach such a feverish uh, 
situation in some case where they decide we've got nothing to lose in terms of because the regime or we're losing legitimacy. We need to really whip the country into a nationalist frenzy. These things happen. And they said, what's the best way to do that? The best way is to just invade Taiwan. I mean, if you had it, if you had instability in, in China, in mainland China, you could see how that might lead to people becoming bonkers enough to decide that invading Taiwan uh, was was the only way to go. I, I don't think they're at that point right now. I agree with you that it, it's just so unlikely at this point for so many logistical, tactical, whatever reasons. Um, but you never know what happens when you might reach a point of instability domestically. Right. And that's, you know, one of the core, <laughs> core, I think, insights that people need to take into account when they're thinking about foreign affairs and international relations and whatnot is the radical uncertainty of the future. That, uh, I mean, if in 1900, if you showed, you know, all the world leaders, here's the world in 2022, I mean, they would, I mean, they couldn't even comprehend it. No one could have predicted how the 20th century went, just as we can't predict how this century is going to go. And so uh, I would argue that's a that's an argument in favor of prudence and uh, not doing crazy things. Well, and I think another reason for prudence is that the United States cannot count on the rest of the world for just backing up the U.S. and its strategic goals no matter what. And I think uh, an important lesson is being learned in the case of Russia. So in the case of Russia, right, it's it's even less ambiguous than if if China were to invade Taiwan, where Russia has invaded what everybody recognized as a totally sovereign country, i.e. Ukraine, and killed a lot of people there and has in many ways cut off trade and generally done things that most countries consider to be a bad thing. You you invade a neighboring country and you declare war on them. And yeah, I, I would say that, yep, yeah, Ukraine did a lot of things to provoke Russia. But I think most of the, the, the world looks at that and they say, OK, well, I, I don't think that I don't think a big country should invade a smaller country and just seize territory like happened. Nevertheless, even with most most people saying, yeah, that invasion, that was a bad thing. The U.S. has not gained nearly the amount of support I think they anticipated they would have in most of the world after this invasion took place. And you saw this in the U.N. vote where you didn't you didn't get condemnation. You, you had a lot of abstaining from the vote on when the U.N. took a vote on uh, should we just condemn Russia? A lot of countries just abstained. And yeah, you only had like half a dozen countries actually vote in favor of Russia. But most of the world was like, not our not our problem, not our business. And this included like most of the world's population. So you had you had India, you had Russia, you had huge numbers of countries in uh, Africa. Yes, the 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 Western world, the quote unquote free world, the U.S. aligned world. Yep. You had NATO, Australia, the U.S., but the rest of the world is like, I want to stay out of it. I want to maintain trade with Russia. I want to keep getting my wheat from Russia. I want to keep getting my oil from Russia. And I'm just really not interested in picking a fight with Russia just because the United States says Russia is bad. So this attempt at, I think, creating this new this new model of, well, there's the first world, which is America, the free world. There's the, the second world again. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> that's Russia again. And then there's the third world or the non-aligned countries, but we're actually going to bring them all over to us. So it seemed like the U.S. would have loved to have had this sort of new world order where we had we had, quote unquote, free world aligned against Russia and everybody who loved democracy would support America. But that didn't happen. You had lots of countries that are, you know, marginally democratic or which the U.S. even recognizes as democratic, just staying out of it. And then you've got India buying oil from Russia. You got, of course, the Chinese doing lots of that. And so I think there was a somewhat rude awakening for the State Department to just wake up and realize, oh, most of the most of the world doesn't really actually care what U.S. strategic goals are in Eastern Europe. And you see that explicitly with Saudi Arabia 
where they're just coming out and saying, hey, we want to build bridges to all countries. We're not we don't we don't want to make any enemies. We want to we want to deal uh, fairly with China and with the United States and with whoever else is willing to come and play with us. And that seems to be where the where most of the world is really interested in being right now. And so it wouldn't seem that beyond countries that are enmeshed in the issue like Japan, and even then Japan might be interested in, in having negotiated settlements and really just trying to avoid a major global conflict. But this idea that the U.S., which faces no real threats to the Western uh, hemisphere from China, that the U.S. is in a position where it can make lots of moralistic demands and say, well, we're not going to stop fighting until X, Y, Z happens and uh, we will we will never give up. Well, a lot most of the world look, faced with the issue of being cut off from trade with China or maybe facing some side some sort of military collater, collateral damage from China, uh, a China that's that freaks out in the face of a conflict with the United States, with, which then maybe starts really asserting its control over the South China Sea and so on, that would make a lot of its neighbors really uncomfortable. So I could see how th the world is not going to just line up to back up the U.S. in any sort of conflict that the U.S. might seem to be courting with the Chinese. Right. Um, yeah, as you say, the case with Russia is so, <laughs> it communicates volumes. I mean, even NATO countries, uh, I mean, those close to Russia, much more eager to, you know, support Ukraine. Those further away, a good bit less inclined. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd, like Germany is actually lowering, <laughs> decreasing their defense budget for the next year. If I remember correctly, like they announced, oh, we're going to spend all this extra money. And then they're like, actually, <laughs> because we're doing that, we can lower the regular budget. And it's I think it's actually lower in both percentage and like actual raw numbers. It, it's it's so absurd. Um, uh, India, I think, will be immensely important in any kerfuffle in East Asia. And they aren't friendly with China in the past few years. They, they've beaten each other to death. Their soldiers have beaten each other to death in this sort of uh, contested um, uh, border area that's huge. It's vast. It's up in the mountains. It's not a great place to fight. But both sides have installed stalled over the decades tons and tons and tons of infrastructure so they could, you know, shuttle 50,000 troops up to fight in the Himalayas if they need to. And, um, but at the same time, I India was not aligned in the Cold War, and they're probably also not very eager to be, you know, the U.S.'s lapdog <laughs> uh, in any confrontation with China. Because the U.S. track record is so clear, uh, despite all our highfalutin moralistic rhetoric, at the end of the day, we're entirely interested in U.S. interests. <laughs> um, so we're not going to be looking out for the best interests of India or anyone over there. We're going to be looking out for our own interests. And we can see this in the situation in Ukraine. <laughs> uh Officials have more or less said, you know, we don't want Ukraine to negotiate before we're ready. Uh, you know, uh, they're willing to sacrifice Ukrainian troops who receive two weeks training before being sent off to be cannon fodder for the mass Russian artillery. Um, that's one of the benefits of being so secure and being a regional hegemon who controls that entire hemisphere of the globe. We're not the ones suffering. Uh, and even in Europe, this winter, Americans might have some high heating bills, but we're not actually going to, you know, be rationing gas or anything. Germany, they're, they're already rationing. How much, like they've shut off hot water to public buildings, uh, or turning lights out at night. I mean... Uh, these countries are going to be in for quite a painful winter for the sake of Ukraine. And I think we're going to see quite a shift in public opinion when that happens. You know, there's always that significant portion of uh, libertarian types and just uh, 
people in general, a lot, they do tend to be, I think, more on the either the libertarian side or kind of the far right conservative side. And they're always looking for the better country to move to, right? Amer <laughs> America's getting so bad. What other country am I going to move to? And before COVID, there's a lot of talk of various European countries you wanted to move to. And New Zealand was popular uh, right. for a while. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and but now, but now after the the Ukraine invasion, right? Central Europe doesn't look quite so fun. As it looked and you know, I've just looked at the map for years. I'm like, boy, being in, well ensconced in the bosom of the North American landmass uh, has its advantages for sure, because you're just so far from these geopolitical conflicts, uh, with the exception of nuclear war. But then being in Europe, in, in the case of nuclear war, doesn't help you either. So they they uh, has, so, yeah, I mean, if I got to move to Idaho or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a whole lot better than being in, uh, I don't know, Eastern Hungary or whatever, where situations of immigration, of conflict with major powers are just so much more tenuous than they are when you're just in the Western Hemisphere. I mean, Latin America is pretty secure, too, because of that. Uh, and so you could be, yeah, sure, move to Paraguay, too. You'd probably be in a pretty good situation geopolitically there as right. well. Right. Short of the UK, you know, attacking slash defending the Falklands. Were any other power to do amiss in any way with any South American country, the U.S. would, it would be quite terrifying. <laughs> uh, the response would be immense and overwhelming. Um, well, and so the U.S. is in this this position. And this makes me think of our old friend, though. We, I think we can wrap up with wondering... What would what would our buddy John Mearsheimer uh, want to do now? A lot of he's kind of in recent years and he's all famous at the moment for talking about Ukraine and all that stuff. And he's had a lot of insights there. Uh, but he he's a realist. I'm a realist, but I'm more of a defensive realist. So I, I think uh, Mearsheimer, who's an offensive realist and thinks that every country is always trying to maximize its influence, at least as a regional hegemon. So he, he thinks China is going to be real aggressive. At least that's my reading of it. And and does have and he may be right that in an ideal world, China's policy is to push the U.S. out of East Asia past both the first and second island chains back out to Hawaii, basically. Right. Uh, and so he said in the past, so the U.S. needs to really work then to balance China uh, in Eastern Asia. Well, the question is, then, is that. Well, what does that mean? So say you had a bunch of people. You could see how this is the one one of the few places where you'd have people at the Pentagon wanting to actually listen to Mearsheimer. It's like, look, we got this guy who says we we can't just let China do whatever they want in in East Asia. And so what does that look like then? So say so the the State Department, whatever, uh, they agree. Right. We got to do something to to contain China and East Asia. What does that look like without prompting World War III and really keeping things uh, from from spinning out of control? Or does the U.S. just finally admit, look, we got all these bases in Japan. Japan can have its own military. We, we, we got Hawaii. We got Guam even. Well, we won't be pushed out past Guam. I guess they could make a last stand on the second <laughs> island chain there. Uh, but, but what does sane policy look like here? Now, of course, as a as a Rothbardian type, obviously the ideal situation is Taiwan becomes an independent state and the U.S. pulls back and uh, China's its own regional hegemon. And that's no threat to the United States whatsoever. But I know lots of people, including Mearsheimer, disagree with that idea. So so from from a more Washingtonian point of view, what's what's the sane policy in East Asia? Yes. So. Uh... I'm much more on the offensive realism side, but I must say I do differ with John Mearsheimer, who I love so much. Uh, last year, he participated in a debate about China and all that, and he explicitly said not only should the U.S. work to defend Taiwan, but that it will. Um, and at the time, I felt like Padme in uh, Revenge of the Sith. You know? <laughs> I, I don't. I, you're going down a path I can't follow. You. You're breaking my heart, John Mearsheimer. Um, I'm. I am in favor of balancing 
against China. But I am much more in favor of leading from the rear, as it were. Uh, we have partners in East Asia who are filthy, stinking rich countries who could themselves deter Chinese expansion. One being Taiwan, which has immense resources. It has a lot to work with in terms of defense. I mean, the island has been prepared for invasion since 1950. <laughs> um, the other is Japan. And unfortunately, Japan is another country that has been free riding off the U.S., in part from our own very foolish policy <laughs> after World War II, where we wrote, I mean, Americans basically wrote the Japanese Constitution, and we wrote the Japan forever <laughs> uh, uh, abandons the idea of settling disputes through war, and it will never have a military. Well, almost immediately, once the Cold War started, people were banging their heads and going, what dumb idiot wrote this in it? And Japan loved it. There's this whole thing called the Yoshida Doctrine, which is that they, they explicitly knew if we create a military, the U.S. will have us fighting in Vietnam or wherever, Korea and Korea at the time when all this was happening. But the, the doctrine of the Japanese government during the Cold War was explicitly let the U.S. provide our defense so we can invest in our economy. <laughs> and it worked great for them. Now that the, um, if I'm remembering correctly, I sometimes get all these foreign political parties mixed up. I believe the governing party of Japan is the Liberal Democrats. And they have been in power in Japan all but like two or three times since I think 1955 or something. But they've never had a huge majority. And they govern with this other smaller sort of right-wing party. Well... Um, Shinzo Abe was assassinated, I believe, like the day before the elections for the Japanese parliament's upper house. And it seemed to have generated quite a sympathy vote for his party. He was, he's, for those who don't know, he was the former prime minister who stepped, he was longest serving prime minister since the Second World War. He stepped down for health reasons, but he was still immensely influence, uh, influential. He was assassinated, and the governing party wins enough of a majority that it is now expected that they will probably, it's at least conceivable, they will alter the Constitution to change the article that forbids them from having a military. I mean, they have a vast, I mean, relative to, you know, for today's time, they have a big military. It's technically <laughs> police force, the Japanese self-defense force. And it, with that out of the way, we can expect more Japanese militarization. That is, if the U.S. doesn't mess everything up by saying, Japan, we've got it, we'll, we'll take care of it, you can continue to free ride. So if Zach Yost was, you know, <laughs> running things, it would be, you know, bringing our partners in East Asia to come to Jesus moment of, you guys have to defend yourselves, we'll support you you know, from way back here <laughs> and um, sort of farming off that containment. And uh, I think we can do that in a smart way that does not overly antagonize China. I mean, no matter what we do, China will squawk and complain and, you know, issue threats. But there's, uh, at the end of the day, there are red lines we don't want to cross with China. It'd be disastrous, immensely foolish to position U.S. troops in Taiwan, completely opposed to that, think that'd be a terrible idea. But that's not to say we can not sort of work coordinating partnerships from back here in the Western Hemisphere. India and China, I mean, it, it seems that their relationship is not going to improve greatly um, at any time in the near future. But at the same time, the U.S. It would not be out of the realm of possibility that the U.S. would mess it all up. The perfect example of this being Russia and China. Uh, for a long time, I mean, uh, Ru the 
back the Soviet Union and China had horrible relationships. And I mean, literally we're fighting tiny little wars over like uninhabited islands in the Amur River. Well, in the early 2000s, if I'm remembering correctly, they resolved all outstanding border disputes. And U.S. conduct since that time has only driven Russia and China closer together. And it seems that this visit to Taiwan is just ensuring that China and Russia are going to continue to grow closer together. China is very vulnerable in terms of how much food and oil and whatnot it imports from the rest of the world. Well, if they're engaging in any kind of long-term thinking at all, they'll know, well, the secure thing to do is to rely on Russia to import these things. So I suspect Russia and China are going to be close together for the foreseeable future. And that's quite a mistake, I think, uh, that they'll write about in future centuries. Um, But I think We can have a a sane containment policy against China that just steps back from us doing everything. We can let other people take care of themselves with our assistance. We don't need to have this very toxic, codependent relationship with Taiwan and Japan, I would say, are the main people to be involved in this. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it at that then for this episode of War, Economy and State. Thank you, Zach, for joining me. And uh, this is a monthly show, so we'll see what global disasters transpire in the next few weeks uh, (laughs) as we plan for September's episode. But uh, we do plan to be back. And so we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. 